it's great to be in the house of God. Okay. Wonderful. Good morning, choir. Yeah, I'll move that. All right. Uh, okay, you may be seated this morning uh, for the announcements. Uh, let's see. This morning, uh, I'd like to, I had scheduled for today, for this afternoon, uh, to start a new uh, book study on the Methodist class band. I think we're going to wait until next Sunday at 5 o'clock to do that. I've got a three-hour Zoom call uh, and from 2 to 5, and I'm thinking I won't be uh, in too good a frame of mind to uh, conduct a, a Bible study. So anyway, I, I do want to uh, uh, make sure you know that starting next Sunday at 5 o'clock, we'll... Uh, We'll start this book study on the Methodist class band, and we'll continue that through uh, the Lent season. Talking about Lent, Wednesday night, there will be no Wednesday night dinner here at, at all, uh, just for this coming Wednesday night only, because it's Ash Wednesday. So we're going to have the Ash Wednesday service at Patterson, at seven o'clock, uh, that's Wednesday evening, seven o'clock, Ash Wednesday, we'll uh, be doing the imposition of the ashes. And uh, so uh, try to come to that. If you know someone who needs a ride, uh, try to reach out to them and bring them over there and we'll, uh, we'll uh, have Ash Wednesday service. And Judd's going to leave it, lead it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was in a meeting yesterday, and my phone went off too, Judd. So, you know, that's the way it goes. Anyway, praise God for that. Do we have, oh, yes. Go ahead, Kathy. Okay. For those of you on Zoom, by the way, welcome Zoom uh, folks. Uh, food pantry tomorrow and come in about 9 or 9.15 volunteers. The truck will be here about a quarter till 10. And then, of course, at 4.30, we uh, distribute the food to folks coming in from the community. Uh, do we have any other announcements we need to talk about? Ah, well, happy birthday, Karen. So, <laughs> uh, any other announcements? Okay, well, this morning, Becky is our liturgist. Good morning, church. All right. Please stand for the call to worship. Mighty ruler, lover of justice, great king, enthroned one, 
You are exalted over all people. We worship at your holy mountain. Okay, now remain standing. And our opening hymn is Shine, Jesus Shine. This is out of the Faith We Sing book, page 2173, verses 1 and 2. today is from Psalm 99. Praise to God for his holiness. The Lord is king. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. Mighty king, lover of justice, you have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Extol the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel also was among those who called on his name. They cried to the Lord and he answered them. He spoke to them in the pillar of cloud. They kept his decrees and the statues that he gave them. O oh Lord, our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God to them, but an avenger of their wrongdoings. Extol the Lord, our God, and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord, our God, is holy. Our uh, next song is High Upon a Mountain by the Chancel Choir. Yeah. 
This is Transfiguration Sunday. Uh, and the last Sunday after Epiphany, before Lent. So from the Book of Common Prayer, let us join together in prayer. O God, who before the passion of your only begotten Son revealed his glory upon the holy mountain, grant to us that we, beholding by faith the light of his countenance, may be strengthened to bear our cross and be changed into his likeness from glory to glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Lord God, this morning we have several in our congregation that need a touch of healing from you, Lord. Ask that you supernaturally have agency and action into their lives and bring them strength, relieve them from pain, help them to be uh, your faithful witnesses. So Lord, we all have our own little uh, aches and pains, some of them major, some of them minor. But Lord, it, it, to me, it just kind of pales in comparison to what some people in our world are going through. So today, I want to take special time here to lift up to you the people of the Ukraine uh, that we know that you are with them. Give them assurance and strength. The people of Russia, Lord God, we know that this is not what their will is. We know that it's their leader's will, trying to impose their will upon another sovereign nation, Lord. And so for the people in Russia, we pray this morning to give them strength uh, and a bold witness to speak up in the face of, it may not be a popular thing to speak of. Lord God, for Bishop Kahagi, the bishop in the Methodist Church in Ukraine and Russia, we ask that you give him strength and give him wisdom and just lead, guide, and direct him on how to lead the church in these two nations, Lord God. Give him clarity on how to bring healing and lift one another up in a time of tragedy. We pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. This is Transfiguration Sunday. If you remember correctly, uh, Transfiguration Sunday is where we remember when Jesus, Peter, James, and John went on top of the mountain, and there Jesus was lifted high up and illuminated, and on one side was uh, the prophet Elijah, and the other side was the prophet Moses. And so this is the time of year before Lent. We, we celebrate that. It's a, a time that we commemorate uh, that Jesus is the fulfill of all of the law and all of the prophets. Now also in that story of transfiguration, Peter doesn't know what to do. So he offers up... Um, 
to Jesus, uh, well, he offers up to God after God speaks. You know, let me build a, a tent for all three, which is a callback to the Festival of Booths, which actually takes place at this time in Nehemiah. Uh, this is where it is recalled by the people of Jerusalem, uh, the Festival of Booths, where they uh, uh, found it written in the law that the Lord had commanded by Moses that the people of Israel should live in booths during the festival of the seventh month. Uh, so where I'm going to read this morning, uh, this will be our final Sunday in the book of Nehemiah. So I'm going to read uh, verse 8, verses 1 through 12, excuse me, uh, 1 through 8, excuse me, and then later on, 9 through 12. All of the people gathered together into the square before the water gate. They told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday. In the presence of the men and women and those who could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. The scribe Ezra stood on a wooden platform that had been made for the purpose, and beside him stood several saints of God that I can't pronounce their names on his right hand, and several more on his left hand. Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people when he opened it. All the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. Then they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Several more of the uh, old saints of God here and the Levites helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. So they read from the book, from the law of God with interpretation. They gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today is our last Sunday in the book of Nehemiah. And the whole congregation said, Amen, Amen. Uh, I have enjoyed our journey through Nehemiah, even though verse uh, or chapter 8 isn't the end. The, the people of Jerusalem and Judah still have a lot of things to go through. But uh, I thought this morning we might do something kind of fun. Since this is the last Sunday, I thought maybe I would just kind of quiz you on what you've learned so far. Okay, my first question for you is, when and where did uh, this book of Nehemiah start out in? When and where? Yes? Babylon? You're close. Uh, Babylon, which had been taken over by the Persians, it's now Persia, in the year 455, 456 BC. Okay. So, what was Nehemiah's position? in the court. 
He was the cupbearer. Okay, very good. You got that. Uh, at your pastor's attempt at a bad joke, what is my nickname on based on a 20th century soft drink that we called Nehemiah? Grape Nehemiah. <laughs> Very good, Paul. <clears throat> okay. Uh, what three guys would you not want to name your children or grandchildren after? Sand Ballot? Tobias? Sand Ballot, Tobias? I'll give you a minute to look at it. Yes, you know, that's right. Sam Bell. If you want to add a fourth one, how about Vladimir? We don't want to name any of our kids after Vladimir. Uh, so anyway, this, those are the three guys that are the bad guys. So for the purposes of this sermon series out of Nehemiah, our journey through Nehemiah, uh, I have called this to be a metaphor for rebuilding the church. Very good. Yeah, you guys have been listening. How many days did it take them to rebuild the wall and the gates? 52 days. All right. Okay. You guys have uh, passed the test. You're all going to heaven. How about that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. One final question, and this is for the choir. This is for the choir, and I know you can get it. What? Western TV uh, term did your pastor use to describe being attacked by surprise? Dry gulch. There you go. Okay. So the choir gets to go to heaven now, too. So the wall has been built. The gates have been repaired. People of Jerusalem had come together and they had faced one another, the haves and the have nots, the officials and the uh, top of the social strata of Jerusalem, the rich folks had been made to understand that what they were doing to the poorer folks was a sin and had restored back to uh, those who had lost their orch orchards, their vineyards, their farms. They had uh, and stopped charging them uh, usurious interest rates uh, and uh, had restored the folks that needed help that couldn't even afford to, to eat. They recognized that as a sin by confronting what oppression means, what selfishness is, what God needed them to do in their giving. And finally, Nehemiah as an example of servant leadership. But that's all well and good until these three guys try to dry gulch Nehemiah. But Nehemiah, he just keeps on going. 
He just keeps trudging ahead. He doesn't fall for the traps. He doesn't fall for the criticism. He doesn't fall for the false narrative that is coming against him. And he keeps moving on. And there is, they finished the wall in 52 days. And there is now hope again. There is hope for the city of Jerusalem. There's hope for uh, Judah. There's hope for the people of Israel. The hope for the people of Judah. So that brings us to today. Uh, Nehemiah uh, gets together with Ezra, who is the chief scribe. And uh, they bring all these folks together. Uh, they gather together into the square before the water gate. Ezra brought the book of the law of Moses. Accordingly, Ezra brought the law before the whole assembly, both men and women, all who could hear with understanding. He read it facing the square before the water gate from early morning till midday. That's a long time to hear somebody preach. In the presence of men and understanding, of those who could understand, the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Ezra stood on a wooden platform. It was a modern-day uh, pulpit for them. And beside him stood several members of the priesthood. They stood together in a unified effort. They came together. Ezra read the book of the law. Ezra read the Bible to them for what they knew as their Bible at the time. I mean, they didn't have this kind of a Bible, but they had the book of the law, the Ten Commandments, the law that Moses had brought to them that got them into trouble in the first place because they just completely, the culture of the day, they discounted all of the scriptures. That got them into trouble that led them out into captivity and marched to Babylon uh, in the first place that got them into trouble. So culturally, they had gotten away from listening to God. They had gotten away from hearing from God. But as they were rebuilding the walls and the gates and fortified Jerusalem, something happened to them. Something happened to them both uh, from a physical standpoint of fortifying uh, their city, their beloved city, and uh, reclaiming it. Something happened to them spiritually, where something within them, as a group and a body of people, of God's chosen people, realized that something was missing out of their life. That they, when Ezra read to them the book of the law and spent hours doing it, it penetrated their hearts. It spoke to their innermost being. And it made them a little bit sad. But you know what? They changed. They changed. They decided they're going to follow the book of the law. They're, it's like the darkness had been lifted from them. That this... Uh, overarching satanic uh, oppression that had kept them down had been lifted. Now they have hope. They have hope simply by listening and hearing the word of God. The law, the book of the law, which we know as the Ten Commandments, it gave them rules for living.
gave them guidelines for living. They were so blessed, the people answered by saying, Amen, Amen. They didn't let it go from there. They raised their hands. They worshiped God. They praised God by raising their hands. Amen, Amen. So be it. So be the word in our lives. They changed from a culture of whatever you want to do goes to here is the book of the law this is how we should live following God they bowed their heads and they worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground now several of the uh, priests and the Levites helped to disciple these folks by helping them understand the law while the people remained in their places. So you had these priests, these Levites, going out amongst all of these people, trying to teach them, now this is what this means in the law. It's what we would call today discipleship. They gave the sense so that the people could understand the reading. Verse 9. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to the Lord, and do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites stilled all the people, saying, be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. Wow. This is a holy day for them. This is a holy day. This is uh, Nehemiah and Ezra and the Levites are telling the people, don't cry. Don't cry. This is a day to rejoice because darkness has been lifted and replaced with the light. You have been illumined just as Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration with Moses and Elijah, just as Jesus as the fulfillment of the law and the prophets was illumined. So were these people. Their lives were illumined. Don't be sad. In fact, Take your families, go home, and rejoice in the fact. Make the word of God central in your home. Eat, uh, feast, prepare enough to share with those who don't have anything, and be happy about it. There's a new word we've come across. I mean, every once in a while we have new buzzwords that show up in uh, our theological cir uh, circles, you know, like intentional and one thing. Well, now the new one is winsome, which I like that word because it means to be positive and, and to be happy. Don't be in a bad mood because of the word. Rejoice because the, the word has come to form you and transform you. Ezra and Nehemiah and the Levites are saying, be winsome. I think that's kind of the message for us here in the church today as, uh, you know, yesterday, Bob Kaldenberg and I 
uh, were at Altoona at a church working retreat, and I found it uplifting. And you know, at the very end, the minister that was kind of the in charge, guess what book that he had a short devotional out of? It was Nehemiah. And we all stood around the church building. And uh, everyone was uplifted. And that word winsome came out again. Be winsome. I think that there is hope for the church. I don't think there is. I know there is. I know there, there's a lot of uncertainties around what's going to happen with the church. There's a lot of uncertainties even around the culture in North America, how the culture uh, of society is more of an influence on the church than the church is on culture and society today. But I think that a group of committed individuals that want to go back to their homes and rejoice and make the word central in their homes, that we can little by little rebuild the church. And it's not to where just a few have to do it all. Now, this wasn't an original thought. This is what the ministry said yesterday, but it rang true for me. Just as the people of Jerusalem and different groups like the Levites and the priests took a small part of the wall and rebuilt it, and maybe one gate, uh, and, and you had numerous taking one small part within 52 days, they did an impossible job. And now they're attending to their spiritual health, letting the word bring light and life into their life and rejoice. Rejoice. This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn. Uh, oh, yeah. And for this day is holy to our Lord. So do not be grieved. For the joy of our Lord is your strength. Folks, what is God calling you to do? It's not on all your shoulders, individually, all on your shoulders alone to rebuild the church. Groups of you can get together. Small groups of you. Small groups. That's where I believe this church is, is, is headed. We've started that work already with small groups. Get together. Be winsome together. Take a small part of the church and rebuild it. Uh, whether that be in evangelism or discipleship, but just having coffee with three or four other people and talking about where God has showed up in your life or where you're struggling in your life. I hope that we can take this Nehemiah journey and move forward. Certainly we'll have challenges. Certainly we'll have detractors. But you know what? As your leader, whatever God has called you to do, come talk to me about it. If, if it's on your mind to do, it's on your heart to do, we'll find the resources somehow, some way to help you. I'll help you. But the main thing is rejoice in it. Be glad in it. The joy of the Lord is your strength. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our final hymn is number 600, Wonderful Words of Life. 600. i 
wonderful words of life. Let me more my may the God of peace who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant make you complete in every good so that you may do his will, working among those that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be the glory forever and ever.